I know we've been on this unfolding within the Extinction Rebellion community about how we work together, build power, formalize networks or organizational structures. And I've had opportunities to speak with a number of you in the past. When we talk about decision-making, we're really talking about um, an exercise of power. So it's a very potent process, making decisions. And so we wanna really be thoughtful about how we do that. And decision-making processes in and of themselves are one piece of a much larger, let's say complex system of how groups move forward together, right? Because there's the decision-making process itself, but there's also what is the meeting structure and culture? What is the skill of the facilitators and how you work that process? What are the values and culture that you're trying to advance? in this, right? And all of these things are interrelated. It's like, how are we organizing? How are we making decisions? How are we building our organizations, right? So there's all these different pieces. But tonight, I know we're really talking about consensus is what I was really asked to talk about. So another thing I just want to say is kind of an opener is that really at the end of the day, it's not like there's one process that's right and the rest are wrong. It's not like that. And it's not even like within the scope of a particular school of thought of a decision-making process that there's only one way within that. And I think that's one reason why we are in this kind of challenging place today because we're being presented with this idea of consent versus consensus as opposed to voting. And consent in many ways evolved and is very quick, closely related to consensus. And depending on who you are and how you define it, they're exactly the same, even though some people may do the process differently. So I say all that is that what the important thing is at the end of the day is that whatever group this is, so if, let's just say for, for the purposes of XR, that whatever processes and structure you're using, that you everybody knows what they are, People are trained to know how to work and use them, right? Um, and that's the key thing because ideally there would be like one way across all these different orgs or chapters, but it may vary depending on your local culture and community. I've been, ever since I sort of got hooked, connected to XR, I've been swimming in this world of like holacracy and sociocracy, trying to understand what is this and how is it different from what we have always historically done in a lot of the direct action movements in the United States. Best that I can tell is that the direct action movements in the United States have always been focused on democracy and direct democracy in particular, but using consensus as the decision-making process in which we are engaging in a democratic process. And as I look to, to see these different words, so we can learn that we're governed. So democracy, sociocracy, and holacracy are all different uh, orientations towards governance. In ancient Greek, demos meant the village or citizens or people. So it is seen, democracy is seen as that process for large numbers of people, the whole community. Sociocracy, the best I can tell, is that it is really rooted in this idea of who are you grouping with? Who are your partners, your associates, your companions, right? Who is that community and working within that community? And holacracy, one of the reasons it's different than these other two is because it actually comes out of corporate America. It was developed by a corporation to move beyond hierarchical management models to more flat networked models. And in all three of these, democracy, sociocracy, and holacracy, or I should really put it direct democracy, the best I can tell, we are all advocating that we work in circles that we work in self-organized groups, affinity groups or working groups or councils, right? And I think that's common through all three of these systems. 
from best I can tell. And let me just say, I spent my lifetime working in consensus and in networked models and self-organized groups. I am not an expert in sociocracy or holacracy. And so I'm learning myself, but I know that when I was starting to learn, especially through Extinction Rebellion, there were flags that were coming up for me, particularly around holacracy. And, um, and one of the reasons why is because holacracy, while it re is really relating to kind of a whole systems, it's really values and prioritizes autonomy and independence, right? So it was created as a management structure that would, that would do away with the boss always telling people what to do, but create more room for people to actually make decisions about the work that they're working on and not having to be told all the time by somebody else. So let me just keep moving on. So again, as I said, when we began, no matter what the system of governance and the decision-making process that you use, you know, these are some of the elements that I think are essential to be thinking about is again, what are the values? Because the values are gonna be informing the culture. And I think it's important for us to understand that we are so steeped in this dominant culture, oppressive dominant culture rooted in supremacies, wealth, male, white, you know, Christian, you know, we're so inoculated or with that, that they play out in everything we do. And so as we organize for, as, for, as an alternative to that, why we are looking for values and processes and structures and accountability that break us from that dominant culture. And so quite simply, in some ways, if you talk about, you know, if you, we understand that the dominant culture is a culture of death and that what we're trying to build is a culture of life, there's a lot more wisdom coming through these days about uh, what many people call cultures of care and cultures of belonging. So everything we do, the, the, the values we put into practice, the processes that we utilize, the structures that we utilize and how we're accountable, we're trying to build those in the context of inclusion, belonging, care, valuing everybody. So over many years, there's like, there's just various decision-making structures that have been identified over time. Um, and I'll say that this chart right here was probably done before holacracy existed and not before sociocracy, but before sociocracy sort of really took off. Because again, I feel like there was a way that things were being done for a long time. And then these are two new things that have been emerging over the past decade or two. But no structure, rugged individualism, everybody just does what they want, chaos. And we are often sometimes like that, especially in a mass mobilization situation where there's lots of people. It's not necessarily right. Everybody's doing their own thing. Majority rule, which is voting. Again, it's what we are raised in. It's what we are led to believe is democratic. It's what we're led to believe is fair. Um, but it does not take into account differentials in power and privilege. It does not take into account the fact that it creates winners and losers, insiders and outsiders. Um, and there's this idea that it's fast, but if you want to go through a truly uh, thorough process, you know, Robert's rules of orders are the procedural mechanisms for the voting process in any formal structure. And Robert's Rules of Orders is quite a tedious, deadening thing that, whatever, this value to it, but it's like, it's a thing. <laughs> Unanimity, right? We all agree, right? And that often works when you're working in small groups, right? It's easy to agree. Often when I start something like this, and again, I feel like I did a consensus workshop with for Extinction Rebellion, sometime this year, which is why I'm trying to do stuff differently. But if you did do that, I often will start it out with by putting people in groups and asking them to order pizza. So when you think about getting your friends together to order pizza, how do you do it, right? There's a process you all go through to figure out what people want, don't want, da, da, da. And some reason, miraculously, eight, 10 people can decide what pizza they want probably in five minutes, maybe eight minutes, right? 
And that's actually humans much more akin to how we work, just quickly figuring out what everybody needs, how to, how to accommodate. We're working cooperatively because we're a team. Boom, we do it. Um, and so that's a form of informal consensus. And actually humans are much more inclined to be making decisions through informal consensus in everyday life by quickly assessing who we're with, what do we need, what, what works for the service us all. Hierarchy, again, this is what almost every institution in the dominant culture is built in this, where there's a chain of command. Uh, it can be fast, it can be efficient. It's like the boss ordering, the director. And, and there's a place for this. Like we often talk about when, if there's a fire and the fire department is, is, is uh, called out, we don't want them to be operating from place of just like randomness. We want there to be clear direction on what needs to be done. And within that hierarchy, you can see on this chart, there's different forms, but autocratic, one person rule, oligarchic, where they might have experts to give them opinion, or there might be a team of experts, consultative, where they might get advice, and then military and business, where it's a straight hierarchy. And then consensus here is, you know, exploration of solutions, reaching a decision that all can accept. And I want to really highlight that, that all can accept. And we're going to drill down more between that and consent as we go on. Um, but part of this thing around consensus is that it's a process by which, by design, everyone's voice can be heard. Everybody's ideas can be put into the mix. Um, it's, a, it's a process that is encouraging people to work cooperatively to figure out the best outcome. Oftentimes people say it takes more time or it can be very frustrating or it requires good listening skills. You know, any process requires good listening skills. Everything we do requires that. We can all up our game at active listening, especially in this time of trauma, collective trauma where we're all a little bit more like, whoa, what's going on? Second thing is that um, any good decision-making will take time. But this process, again, consensus versus consent versus whatever process you use, if you don't have a good container to engage that process in terms of meeting space, if you don't have skilled facilitators that know what they're doing, right, it's very possible for it to fall apart no matter what process you're using. And the thing about consensus, and I would say consent as well, is that because we are not raised in this culture, understanding that there are others, other way, unless you're a Quaker or you come up in some radical feminist family, we grow up thinking about voting. And so if we wanna use an alternative process, there's gonna be a learning curve, right? There's gonna to have to, there's a teaching that goes on and a learning that goes on and a practice that goes on, right? And so when we think about consensus, you know, consensus works when, when power and our basic values are shared when we're trying to share power and have shared values when we believe that the cohesion of the group is important and i think this is really important to understand it's like you know when we're working in a mass mass movement we have there may be many many different perspectives strategies right that's hard to get a mass on the same page but when we come together in networks or organizations or for common purpose we want to make sure that people who are engaging in this process value our group staying together <laughs> and working together. And that doesn't mean it's about compromise, but it means more about collaboration than like fighting to death to get our way. It's understanding that we want a range of options, right? That there are always a range of options. And I know in consent, so let's just talk about, is it good enough? to go forward? Is it like safe enough to go forward? And I think those are important things. We, can know, we can't be attached to the perfect. We have to be willing to accept what might be the most possible. Where's their energy? Let's go with it. And we'll know more, right? Because we don't have, we don't know what's going to work. We have to try things. And again, it really works, you know, when the group is committed to making it work. A couple other things when it doesn't work, and again, I would apply this to consent as well, if there's no training in the process, right? If one person is holding a lot of the power or perceived to hold a lot of the power, right? Which is again, part of the 
tricks around facilitation, which is another bucket of this piece, but like knowing that if you're a facilitator, you always want to make sure that somebody else is presenting. Like I was on a call the other day and the facilitator presented the proposal and it was like, it's too much. You have to divide it all up. Um, making sure that the agenda has a process where people can all contribute. If it feels like there's no good options, where timing is urgent. If the issue is trivial, huh? You know, this is another thing that's really important to understand in, in any structure, but particularly in the, you know, horizontal structures we've been using is knowing that there are many different types of decisions and what decisions need to be made where. Like Occupy Wall Street really got into a lot of trouble because for a long period of time, they took every decision to a massive people's assembly that had hundreds, if not a thousand people using consensus and it was a complete failure and disaster. One, because they didn't have their consensus process down right. But two, you don't want a thousand people making decisions, especially on, on smaller items. So this is where the structure is really important and knowing, you know, as we're building out the work, you know, there will inevitably always need to be working groups, you know, in the dominant culture, they're called committees and the network structures, we tend to call them working groups and some more radical stuff they might be called cells, but small self-organized working groups that are focused on functions. And in, the, in this realm of Extinction Rebellion, in these movements that are committed to direct action, it's also affinity groups. And so the model that we've talked a lot about is affinity groups are primarily about carrying out actions Working groups are primarily about carrying out the work to make these bigger actions effective and to support the affinity groups taking actions. And so uh, decisions that are related to actions should be made by those groups. Decisions that relate to media should be made by the media committee. Decisions that are related to fundraising should go to the fundraising committee. Decisions related to logistics go to the logistics committee, right? They can make decisions there and use the large group for the processes for the uh, for the larger conversations on strategy and uh, if need be on vision of where things are going. So this is really fundamentally the basic process for consensus decision-making. And I wanna say that, again, not everybody uses the identical process and that actually is part of how we've gotten into trouble because there is this mm -hmm. assumption that consensus means unanimity and it does not, <clears throat> at least in how I was raised and how I practice consensus. Consensus means there are no objections. And for those that work in the world of consent, they will say that consent is a process where there are no objections, <laughs> which is why sometimes I'm like, hmm, what's happening here? Um, but fundamentally to just walk through this is you know, there's a discussion about whatever the problem is. And eventually a proposal is created that may either come out of the discussion in the whole group, or it might be coming from a working group. And, you know, again, this is the type of thing where no matter what your process is, the facilitator can make or break you here because creating proposals in a large group process can be very difficult but getting visioning and, and you almost, and it's really about having a facilitator that knows how to do that, to get the ideas out, to work in small groups, to harvest them, to prioritize, to, right? There's a whole process that requires a skilled facilitator that, to get you to a proposal in a large group process. I'm much more of an advocate of trying to get proposals to be worked out in working groups or by affinity groups and then be, being brought to the whole to then make decisions on them. So this is a better sense of the flow. And again, a lot of this mirrors consent, only consent uses the language of rounds. And I'm not convinced from what I've been able to look at that it makes any much more sense than this process of consensus right here. So if you come down here to the flow of a cooperative decision-making process, background, bring out discussions, develop a proposal. So the steps are, once a proposal is made, is clarifying questions, right? Do we understand what is being presented? And from what I can tell, that's one of the first steps of co the consent process. <clears throat> After all the questions are asked, the next step are um, 
are there any concerns? What are the concerns? And this is where having a scribe and a flip chart is really helpful to list what the concerns are. Once the concerns are all out there, right, then there's can be discussion and an amendment process to address the concerns. And you can just, if you've got them on flip chart, you can just draw the line them. Have we addressed this concern? Boom, right? So you just know that you've got all the concern to address. You would represent the proposal. And then you would test for consensus. And the way, again, I was always taught is, are there any other outstanding concerns? Are there stand asides? Are there blocks? And if not, there's consensus. So to break that down a little bit more, stand asides are where people don't really like the proposal, aren't excited about it, but they don't think it is fundamentally against or will hurt us. They don't think it's fundamental against our mission or that it will do harm, right? We just don't, doesn't float our boat. So in that case, we're just gonna stand aside and say, go for it, but don't count on me. A block is, a, I don't wanna say it's an extreme act, but part of our training and teaching people is to learn that a block should be done rarely, very rarely in one's lifetime. Um, and a block is basically designed to say, I believe that if you go forward, this will is fundamentally counter to our mission. It will do harm. It may destroy our organizing. And I cannot in good faith and good conscience allow this group to go forward with this proposal. So I'm going to block it now. And it can stop the whole process or send it back. But the thing is about this is that if you do your job well in addressing concerns and making addressing them, truly addressing them, you're not gonna have any blocks. And so again, as a facilitator in any process making it really clear because I have been known uh, <clears throat> in a process where someone has blocked a decision who never spoke up about a concern. And in my book, that's an abuse of power. So again, it goes back to the training and the teaching and building a culture of how we do this together. Because somebody that blocks it and who hasn't actually participated in the process clearly is not demonstrating that they are valued the cohesion of the group, right? Because a block is going to stop things from going forward. <clears throat> One of the things I've learned a lot over these years in doing these consensus processes, however, is that well, a couple of things, only keep one proposal on the table at a time. You can't make decisions on two proposals at once. But two is to understand that sometimes the best way to go forward is not trying to get everybody to do one proposal, but to split the group based on interests and let each group come up with a proposal that meets their needs and then work to tie the proposals so that they support one another. So I'll give you an example of this. You know, one of the myths about consensus is that you can't do it in large groups. Back in the 2000s, I facilitated a meeting of 600 people in a gymnasium in the basement after a big day of action in Washington, D.C. after the IMF World Bank. <clears throat> and it was um, affinity groups and all, but it was packed. And we weren't able, we, we just, there was something that we just couldn't move towards. Some people were like, we have to be at the hotels. Other people were like, we want to be at the convention center. People couldn't, right? And so finally, it was like, okay, fuck it. Let's stop trying to make something happen that isn't moving. Let's split. Those of you that want to do the hotels, you go come up with a plan for that. Those of you who want the convention, you come up with a plan for that. And we did that. And then they came back and both presented their plans. And then we were able to just work them out logistically that when this is over, people go from here to here. And it was done. And people were thrilled because we actually went through a process of 600 people and made a decision that met people's needs. So, 
So again, skill mm -hmm. facilitation is key to any of these processes of working large groups and network structures. Um, after any process of decision, after any consensus decision-making thing, so again, it's like proposal, questions, concerns, amendments, restating it, test for consensus. Now, sometimes proposals might come that are no brainers. And it's like, do we even need to go through a formal process? And that's where straw polls come in. And that's one of the things that I wanted to also highlight that a lot of times in our facilitation, especially when we're newer into movement work, we have we facilitators and we might have a stack keeper. In fact, let me back up on this. In, in consensus decision-making, um, it's also important there's a set of roles that really help build the container to make this process more, more accessible. One is the facilitator, obviously. Maybe there's co-facilitators. Maybe the co-facilitator is taking the stack of order. And we know in this day and age that having a progressive stack of prioritizing Black, Indigenous, queer, trans voices is something we always want to be doing in our spaces. But I've also learned as a facilitator that sometimes I prefer to keep the stack as opposed to somebody else. Because, um, and to also when I'm doing a, a stack to only take like five at a time. Because sometimes you get a stack that goes like 10, 15 people. And then by the time you get there, the per, right? It's like, in, right, I think it's better to keep check, stack short to the point of what we're trying to do and to rotate it. Um, and sometimes to do it yourself because then you can pace it. So facilitator, co-facilitator, a scribe, somebody that will help write on the board. Maybe that's the co-facilitator. Maybe it's somebody with good handwriting. A vibes watcher. And again, this is you know, when in any democratic party process, have you heard them talk about vibe watchers? But in a community of people that are trying to reclaim our humanity, it's it's really helpful to have somebody that's watching the process and the energy of the group, right? And paying attention to, is it getting stressful? Is people getting gritchy? Do we need to take a break? Do we need to like, does, does the facilitator need backup? Like, and being empowered to like stop the process and say, you know what? It's pretty clear to me that there's a lot of tension and why don't we take a few minutes to take a breath or a quick break or a stretch break. So having somebody in that role is great. Two other roles, one on here and one not, is the timekeeper is also super helpful. And that can also be like with, with signs of how much time people have left because the larger the group, the more we have, the more disciplined we need to be in how much space we take up. And the last thing I'll put on a role, which is not on this, is, is orienters or greeters. Again, in the, the vein of a culture of belonging and inclusion, not everybody can get to a meeting right on time. Right, and so is there somebody that greets them at the door, welcomes them, helps them understand where we are in the process, how we do decisions, right? So like making sure that there's somebody outside the process that can help people coming into it that are new and get them up to speed quickly. Curious if you could expand a little bit on how you do this process with very, very large groups in one circle. Mm -hmm. So well, a couple things I would say to that. In that process is where small groups and spokes can help. And that can be, so let me just say, for people that don't know about a spokes council, the basic idea is that from a small group, um, you would choose somebody to then go to the center of the council uh, for the decision-making process. So let's say there's a hundred people in the room, making a decision with a hundred people is hard. So maybe you're dividing those hundred people into groups of 10 and each group is making a decision and choosing a spokes. And then those 10 spokes people come together, right. To weigh in on the proposal. So that's one way to do it is to break it into smaller groups and use a spokesperson because trying to do it in a group of hundred or 200 becomes almost nearly impossible. That's why, you know, when I started this thing out, democracy, the village, like if you're looking at large scale things, of individuals, right? That's where voting might be more handy. But what I do know is that no matter how big your group is, there are ways to break them into smaller groups to go through the process. 
And it might be on some affinity. It might be on some issue. It might be on some lens. And so again, that would be uh, the call of a facilitator. So you can also do, I mean, you can do it. You can, you can have 500 people in a room and do questions and concerns, um, but that's gonna take a lot more time. You know, so like you might break them out into small groups for concerns. So I think at the back and forth between small groups and big group is essential in this process for voices being heard. Because it, it, as you get to a bigger thing, it's more of an assembly model. And that's also where, which I, I think I have it on the other one right here, straw poles are super valuable, right? So again, we have to understand that as facilitators or people who are engaged in group processes, there's a lot of um, tools that we have at our disposal, right? Brainstorming, popcorning, go around circles, stacking, small group discussions, dyads, triads, advantages, disadvantages, straw polls, where's the group, visual aids, right? Criteria for ranking or prioritizing, setting goals, um, equalizers, like putting chips in. You can only speak, every time you speak, you put a chip in, right? Uh, fish bowls where people in the middle go in and have the conversation, right? So there's a lot of different tools that facilitators can use in group processes and so the trick is always to make sure that in whatever you're doing, we're really clear on what are the decisions we need to make? Is this the right space for it? And then what is the best process we can think of to move the group through it? Because I'm trying to think when I did that one with the 600 people, it's they were, we were in affinity groups. And let me just say this too, because this is the other thing about the large versus small group is also how do you know when you have consensus, right? So if you did a if you did a big group, you had a big group and had a straw poll and said, <clears throat> how many people think that we should occupy the front of the White House? How many people think we should not, right? You can eyeball it. If everybody thinks we should do it and there's not one person that thinks we should not, you basically have a decision right there. And then you could just shortcut it if you were the facilitator and just say, okay, it looks to me like we have consensus that we should do this, but let me just say, are there any Concerns, are there any blocks out there? Anybody think we should have, if not, we've just made decision. And you could do that in about a matter of five minutes if it's a simple thing and everybody's gone gung ho for it. So I'm, what I'm really trying to stress is that the culture of how we build our meetings and how we facilitate them is as important, if not more important than the process itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. I think Sid has a question. Yeah, there's different terminologies. There are different decision-making models that we're talking about, but what about governance structure? Can you speak to that? I think part of that is whether you see yourself as an organization with a mission and a formal structure uh, in a kind of traditional sense, right? Are you building an organization? Or are you trying to build like... Um, more of a network that's rooted in common principles, right? So, uh, so, so more traditional organizational model with a mission and bylaws and presidents, if you get your nonprofit, um, you know, it has a very clear governance thing that gets set up. But uh, if you're looking at more of a network model that's more uh, grassroots in nature, even if it was a national network, you tend to have more principles uh, that bind you than a governance structure. Um, but you are usually coming together around a common objective. I mean, everything needs, uh, I mean, no, whether it's no matter what, what of this nature, whether it's a hierarchy or a horizontal network, I mean, there are still elements of governance in all of it. How do you work together, right? And so it's really more in my mind, like, is it a horizontal kind of relationship or is it more of a, a hierarchical or a horizontal relationship? Let's presume that it is networked and it is a more horizontal organization, but, or network, we'll use the word network. 
and say it's national. Maybe we're thinking of XR right now or something, you know, quite like that. Um, but consensus as a choice in your working group or even as a national organization doesn't necessarily detail all of the governance and accountability and communication lines. It just seems like a decision-making process. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's correct. The other part, yeah. So I just wanted it to be said that it's a distinction of that's the way that this group is going to make decisions. The governance can still be decided and governance, not to be confused with government, but mm -hmm. um, the self-management and the deciding um, of what other things, um, the culture of the group and the, the frequency of um, kind of reporting and checking in on things or something like that. To you, is it um, mostly like just decided on the fly or is it really essential that you have some either affinity groups or spokes councils or that's the kind of wider structure that I wanna understand you seeing um, your experience of consensus working in or that it could be flexible and consensus can be used in different horizontal or even kind of hierarchical vertical models. Mm -hmm. You know, the models that I am advocate for are always like um, coordinating models. Right, it's like circles within circles within circles, right? So you've got, uh, there's some organizing hub, core, whatever you wanna call it, whether it's local, regional or national, some group of people who are helping to coordinate, right? Often they may be representing all the different parts. In an ideal world, they're representing all the different parts so that the whole is made up of somebody that's coming from whatever part and they might make decisions by consensus. And each group, you know, and the group as a whole will decide how often it wants to meet and how when we meet and blah, blah, blah. So, Cause the thing is, is this, in, in um, hierarchies and nonprofits, there's laws and rules on how you have to do it. In these other models, there's not laws and rules on how you have to do it, but there are examples of how people have done it Right. And so that's why out of the direct action world, you have a long history of these models of coordinating groups and councils and action councils that work together to build this networked movement. Um, and it seems to me that sociocracy and holacracy are also talking about those circular coordinating models and those relationships. Um, they seem to glom things a lot together, whereas the model I came out of is a much sort of clearer councils representing different parts. And I, I think, you know, in whatever structure it is, it's sort of like, who are the stakeholders? Who is most impacted? Where are their voices in the process of making decisions, right? And, and what's the accountability internally towards that as well, right? Because that's why I started this out this isn't like one thing. This is like whole thing with lots of parts and they're all interrelated. And so the models out of the direct action networks that I've been into are pretty simple models. <clears throat> and I, you know, I've shared pictures of them before. The sociocracy and holacracy, when I look at them, I don't know how to relate to them as much, honestly. But it's just not my experience. Since we're talking about uh, network structures, for, the, for a movement, have you had experience where an organization or a network organized nationally over a period of time in a way that was able to involve local groups in decision-making at the national level? And how did that, how has have you seen that work out? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, <clears throat> I was a part of a group called United for Peace and Justice, um, which was an anti-war coalition made up of local and national groups. And we would have regular assemblies of hundreds and hundreds of people. And we used uh, a modified consensus and we built a leadership structure <clears throat> that was very explicitly majority women, majority people of color, um, like certain percentage of youth, 50% national, 50% local. Like we were very intentional about the leadership body that was formed. And then in the assembly process, we had, it was a consensus, but also modified consensus. So people would bring proposals, 
we use some Roberts Rules of Orders for amendments. Um, and if we could not achieve consensus, then it was like a, a two thirds vote. Um, the Pledge of Resistance very much had local people involved because, you know, one of the things that I've often said about XR, um, and to some of you, in fact, is that for, for me, XR, I was not so much, I was not interested in building another organization. We have enough organizations. I was interested in building a network of people committed to take direct action on climate. And I've always felt that if XR could have a model that's similar to the pledge so that the national, maybe there's one national table made up of reps from all the environmental groups who are committed to direct action. And that XR is sort of like the direct action arm of the movement that's backed by all these other groups. So 350 and Sunrise and whoever, whatever, not Sierra Club because they don't do direct action, but Rising Tide. Like how do we become that part of the movement as opposed to a separate organization? Um, because I feel like we've often spent a lot of time trying to build coalitions with people that have been around for a long time already. You know, I think it's I, all the situation that I can think of, Bob, it's like there has been a process of um, clear representation from local to the nationals or, or a clear council process. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you raised a few other ones, but yes, you did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one question would be about the accountability of a national coordinating group to the you know, local groups. You know, the more the national structure is made up of people from the locals, like, I mean, I actually felt like what we were trying to do with that national strategy working group was the right direction. Um, I think it needed to be more formalized as the primary decision-making space and people to see it as that would have been helpful as opposed to kind of just a coordinating space. Um, you know, it's like rising tide had this problem as well. Like what has happened in more recent decades, I feel like is that the national structures are made up of sets of individuals that are not connected to the locals. So it's just like another team, like a local, it's like just like just like the locals, only they're working at this level here. And people have these illusions that if you say it's national, that it is inherently got more power or privilege, as opposed to it's just different work. It's work that's being done to support other people doing the work. So in the structure we were proposing or trying to move, is like for every function, whether it's the media or the actions, we were trying to figure out, could we have representatives from the local group? So it's like a council structure and all of that. Is there advice for how to kind of introduce and start developing that skill, either as individuals, but also as groups? Because um, I think there's, those are two separate kinds of skills. I mean, training, just training facilitators, having you know an extensive training program for facilitators and then practicing and then uh, uh, developing a culture of kindness where we support our facilitators as opposed to tear them down, you know, because none of, you know, it's hard, it's hard to do a group. So um, training and practice is what there is for it, you know, and supporting each other. So there's two things that are happening, like how do you make decisions together, you know, whatever, sociocracy, consensus. <sighs> and the other thing is how do you structure a, national decision-making process. And I, I personally think that it's a great idea to use spokes councils, but I'd like to know your opinion on those two things. What, like, what's the handbook for, that, that you prefer, that you might think works best for XR, USA, US, for both those two things, the spokes council process and the, you know, consent decision-making, consensus, whatever, sociocracy. But I'm really, I'm mostly interested in the, the handbook you think is best for for so for peace councils because I know that's there's not a lot of handbooks out there for that. There's C.T. Butler's thing, consensus and and yeah, that's it's really one cool, of them. Yeah, but I love it, <laughs> you know. And there's soci a bunch of sociocracy things, but and we could maybe if you have an opinion on which one of those is the best, tell us. But also if you have an opinion, you know, like a 20 to 40 page handbook that we could just follow 
on spokes councils would be marvelous if you have a preference for any of the resources on that. Well, I mean, I do think that on conflict and consensus, the C.T. Butler book is one of the better books on consensus. I don't know that there's any book per se about these decision-making processes um, or these structures. I mean, I wrote some of them in my book, shut it down, but I'm just trying to think where else they're really written up. I mean, there was a thing years ago, the Handbook for a Living Revolution um, by the New Society Publishers. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff on my website. I mean, ACT UP put out a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I don't think there's like one manual on any of this stuff. <laughs> Well, there's one that I saw that I liked and I shared with the group that comes from Seeds for Change out of Britain. I, I don't know, they, do, they have quite like four or five pages just on spokes councils. And I just thought maybe you would know about that one or say yeah, that. Yeah, I've seen their stuff, the Seeds for Change. Yep. I mean, I have, I, I mean, I have, I, I have a ton of shit on all this stuff. So I'm just trying to think, you know, there's a little manual called Together. I mean, the thing is, is that it's not really that, complicated it doesn't have to be that complicated even the training is not complicated what's complicated is dealing with our humanity and our trauma and ego and our humanity that's where these things get complicated because we are we act out of white supremacy and it just fucks everything up <laughs> you know so that's really why I have talked a lot about the importance of the culture that we're building um, is so important. The decision-making processes are not hard. None of them are hard. If you just go through them step by step, they're not that hard. Um, right, but I think the spokes council process is kind of hard. Well, not to understand, to do. Well, only because it's foreign. Yeah. But once you do it, it's not hard. Once you do it, it becomes a no-brainer. So like Shutdown DC has been using this model for the past year. They came out around climate stuff. They did the climate strike last year, organized the 22 shutdowns. XR was a part of it in DC. But they have authentically been using this model. We used it again around this election stuff. And, um, and we've been doing them online and it's been working actually. So it's really... It's not that hard in the realm of, you know, horizontal organizing, you know, there's this concept of federations as well, right? And so, you know, if things that get too big, then you break it into parts, but also knowing that white supremacy encourages us to fragment things, right? Because, you know, because that separation is part of how it pits people against each other. So, but I mean, you could do, uh, a council, you could have regional councils and then have a national council made up of regional reps, right? You could have a council of big cities and a council of urban or rural areas, right? I mean, there's no, it's just a structure. Again, if you're building an organization that you're trying to be around for a long haul and you want a mission and you want to raise that some money, then it's really important that your structure, whatever. But in these network things, we're, it's more, I don't know, I just feel like, um, yeah, no, structures are important. It holds holds it all together. But I just know that we are we are not used to uh, we're not used to taking responsibility to organize, <laughs> which is what self organized groups require. In terms of the personal, Lisa, I mean, one of the things that seems to be emergent, this, I mean, CT Butler and I know each other from Dance New England. In you know, we didn't he when he created the structure for Dance New England, he didn't and also for Bread Not Bombs, he didn't create a peace council to deal with all this personal stuff. But later Dance New England did innovate that. And I think it's coming out of a larger, you know, more distant space where you actually have a meritocratic peace council, a bunch of therapists and healers and all those kinds of people who get together and they say, we're gonna help with the personal crap when it comes up and try to keep us on mission. Yeah, but main, also we're gonna try to be there to solve this all of this interpersonal stuff. And it just seems to me that that's a super great idea. Well, I mean, so, I mean, I've never heard of a peace council before, so I'm not sure where that's coming from, but that sounds fine. I mean, the council structure can be used for anything. And maybe there is like a, 
um, you know, I think what I hear you saying that I think is important is what are the mechanisms or processes within this to resolve conflict? Right? What is the conflict resolution process? Is there a council of elders? Is there, you know, is there, you know, a process where there's a group of people empowered to intervene in this? So that's, you know, I think you're just flagging another part of, you know, in the olden days of the structures, we would have like a process working group mm -hmm. that would deal with all this process stuff. Um, and then there might be a conflict mediation team. You know, movement work is messy and it's often people just throwing down because they want to throw down and they're building community as we go through it. Um, and we know that things come and go. And and I feel like that maybe is the difference right now. I don't think we need to build another 350. I don't think we need a brand. Brands are good, but whatever. Like, you know, I feel like we need to like build something that's gonna support people taking action. That's really pushing the edge and living up to the term extinction rebellion. Because I don't think that what we're doing, we're not gonna get there by what we've been doing. Yeah, I feel like it's, kind of just different different terms for similar things. It I is, like it's all very similar. I'm like sorry, in the ideal structure, the accountability flows where that everyone's a representative that's accountable to their group. And they, the whole purpose of the group is to, is to get the mission done, which is the direct action on the streets to reverse climate change. And, and everyone is accountable to each other within those circles. Yes, yeah. And, and relearning what accountability is about because accountability for white people makes us nervous. We don't like that, that word because we think we're like going to be called to task or whatever. Right? We don't like that word accountability. But really, it means that we have the ability to account for what we're doing. And really, what accountability is about is working to make sure that you do what you say you're going to do in the sense that you know that if you don't, the group is gonna be impacted. So if you can't do it, you let the group know. And that we need to be in relationship with the people who are most impacted to make sure that we are not acting out of white supremacy, of feeling like we know what's best and we're entitled to take this action and we don't need to know the history, right? We don't need to do all these things. So accountability is really about also being in good relationship with people that are outside of our group or who are being affected, who we need to be working together on these things. And so it's like making just that check in. It's in some ways it's a form of consent. Accountability is also a form of consent. Like this is what we're thinking about doing. Does this make sense? Does this feel good? Boom, yes, boom, let's go. Because consent is a good thing, but it's now become part of some other way of thinking about decision-making that was consensus. Like, I'm not, I really don't understand why there's this new process of consent versus what has always worked for hundreds of years known as consensus. Consensus is really about mining for what's not working. What, what, what's, what's the problems with this so that we can get something that will work. Um, and so like, and one of the things I seeing someplace was like, well, we like, I agree from what I can tell from consent, it's this round process. Seems like it would could drive you crazy. Um, having everybody speak where going around is a tool you could use in consensus as opposed to always just doing rounds of the different functions. And then on one of the rounds was where people could express what they like about the proposal. You know, in consensus, it's not as important to spend a lot of time talking about what you like about a proposal, right? You really wanna spend time on what needs to be changed to make it even better or what you would need to make you participate. That's where you wanna spend the bulk of the energy. And that's why the decision is not about, we all agree, the decision is about there's no objections, right? And that's when you have consensus. Thanks, this is great. I um, I just wanted to chime in maybe and then ask a quick question. Um, the way it was, it was explained to me, uh, consent versus consensus is consent, you don't really deal with the stand asides, for example, so it can save time. So it's kind of a, a compromise to save time in the sense that you don't necessarily try to weed out um, the, the little issues, as long as there is a 
uh, a general tolerance of the solution by the group. Now, of course, that that means that you know if if some people consistently don't get what they want, but they can tolerate it, maybe uh, after a fashion they'll be unhappy. But um, but it, it seems, from what I understand, kind of a compromise. Uh, to, to kind of make decisions quicker in a sense, a little bit like the straw poll, right? Mm -hmm. It's a way to, to get uh, a quick, yeah, something quick. Um, and maybe for larger groups, it makes sense to, to use the, the usual consensus model, but that's, um, uh, yeah. Uh, and and I, I kind of uh, related to that um, in terms of uh, back to XR, I was in a couple of the, uh, um, national uh, strategy working group meeting some some time ago and i raised this back up to, to ivy actually earlier today um that uh, th that group uh it hasn't really been meeting anymore do you have any thoughts uh lisa on on how i don't know what what kind of uh, uh process could be uh used to to coordinate or or do we even want coordination in the spirit of of this decentralized structure across the entire US? Um, or or is, is coordination not the right word? Or what, what kind of vision could we have here on national collaboration? Um, well, just a couple of quick things. Like I am, uh, I'm a big advocate of national coordination and aggregating our individual impact. Um, I think there's, if we're if we're just going to be completely autonomous and decentralized, there's no point in having a network or a centralized or a national structure, right? I mean, I think we are doing this because we recognize that <clears throat> local organizing is key, but we need all of us, and at some point we need national impact. So, um, I think it is important that we have an ability to coordinate across the the country. Um, so I would look at the Pledge of Resistance handbooks from Chicago in 1986. They're all, they're all actually on my website. Pledge website. of Resistance handbooks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yelza. Cool. Okay. Good night, y'all. Yeah. And thank you, Lisa, again so You're much. Hey, Thanks, thank Lisa. That was so amazing. Much. My pleasure. Yeah, it was so great.